one thing in scripts when you read them that will make you stop? Stop that will doing make them? Stop, that will make you stop <laughs> reading? Stop and reading. It's a pass. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it is pretty much by four or five you got to get you, don't you? Yeah, and the weight. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> if it's sweaty, <laughs> yeah, when you drop it, you have to go <laughs> in the trash can. Yeah, if it, you know, I would say the first speech that's over like two sentences where you actually have to see writing, if those start to sound false, then it never goes well. Yeah. <laughs> or if you because if it's one word or two, hey, hi, you can't tell yet. Right. But if it's you know, three words, words. Old yeah. judgment. Oh, yeah. Also, uh, string uh, a few uh, together. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Then, you know, yeah. then you can tell. Don't you yeah. have a habit of go also going right through to the end to make sure you're in the last scene? The computer. <laughs> the computer tells you now. <laughs> you're just looking for the sequel. <laughs> the computer there, now. Now the now the computer tells you. You just say what what part are you playing, Larry? The computer says you're on six pages. So, oh, <laughs> Jesus. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just read Larry. Is there any role you would not play? Larry. <laughs> well, this big, this book has just come out, written tin tin. I don't know if I would do that. Yeah. You want to play him? <laughs> yeah, that, it must have been maybe 10, 15 years ago. Someone approached me to play. Um, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. The the oh, the Polanski, the baby. Uh, Robert. Uh, the uh, the What's his name? Um, the killer. Oh, the Elder Manson? Shelter? Oh, Manson. 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 Oh. Manson. Yeah, oh. Charles Manson. Charlie. And I wasn't... Uh, no, you wouldn't hit well, it. I wasn't interested. Why not? No. Well, I just think... Just out of... I think I just felt out of respect to the, the family. And, and, and it, it was just, just... I'm just not interested. It's too, there's too much karma around that. Yeah. It's way yeah. too heavy. Oh, you God. know, these things, the effects, it was an American kind of um, iconic uh, oh, anti-hero kind of thing that Chuck was trying to appeal to. Because um, I used to cut off the top of my trucks, and that's the same thing he did. So they used to stop me a lot. But he, 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 was, he called him Chuck, you know. And you I, mean Charles Manson? Yeah, Chuck. Sorry, that was, I think that was, the, was that was the name of the script, wasn't it? <laughs> Chuck. Yeah, yeah. Chuck. <laughs> Chuck's <laughs> life. <laughs> Friday night. <laughs> no, no, no. Not, I'd cut the top of my truck off because I rolled it over so they had a giant jeep and then they would stop me and say are you related to Chuck and I always played the fifth you know I was <laughs> flat on the ground with my hands out. Gee Nick you got stopped for a lot of things I never knew about that. Yeah I didn't, I didn't tell you everything <laughs> Albert I didn't want to waste it all. You got related to Chuck. <laughs> oh my God. Played where the karma has stayed with you Christopher and impacted you and haunted you? You played King Lear. Yes, that haunts you enough. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. The first part is all right. But the second, once he's on the heath, <laughs> forget it. And then it becomes an entirely other play. It's a play about Gloucester and Edmund. And you're sitting in your dressing room getting stoned, waiting to come on again. And then you come on, finally, and the audience said, Hey, that looks like King Lear. <laughs> They've forgotten all about him. All the so it's, it's not the magisterial piece that uh, they all say it is. It's not the second act. Really. What's, the, what's the toughest role you've had to play? Helen of Troy. <laughs> no. Um, I think the part in The Sound of Music was the toughest. Because Why? Why? Because it was so awful <laughs> and sentimental and gooey. And you had to work terribly hard to try and infuse some minuscule bit of humor into it. You mean you didn't believe everything you said? Oh, shut up. <laughs> well, <laughs> Albert's actually got some, some experience in that territory. <laughs> what, escaping from yeah. Nazis? No, musicals. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's odd with that film because it has become an iconic <laughs> film. Do you perceive it that way or do you think people are simply wrong? No, it's a very good picture if, of, of what it is. And about, but somebody had to be Pe Peck's bad boy, and they, I chose myself. Do you, was making the shift from stage to film difficult for you? 
No, not really. I, as a young actor on the screen, I was very bad. And uh, thought of, uh, one, one was always thinking of how you look when you're young. You know, you, you're always conscious of the profile. You're so conceited. And that's all I thought about. I thought that was all that movies <laughs> were about. And I was quite young. And it wasn't until I hit the drunk stage of my life in the 40s uh, <laughs> that um, I suddenly had fun on film, playing character roles. That's the key? Yeah. yeah. Thank what you. was the first film you had fun with? Um, J uh, John Huston's uh, The Man Who Would Be King. Uh, oh, the, uh, that right. was terrific. Drunk through the whole thing, were you? What? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Is acting fun? Poor George. John Huston was... Uh, you know, he had emphysema very badly by that time, but he was such a marvelous character. He had an oxygen tent on the set, and he used to go in. <laughs> but he always took his cigar with him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Lock the door. That always worked well. Yeah, it does. <laughs> you know, Explosive. He probably direct a lot easier than he could breathe. Mm. Yes. George, uh, yeah. is acting fun or is it hard work? No, I cut tobacco for a living in Kentucky. That was hard work. Did, did you really? <laughs> yeah. I uh, sold insurance door to door. That's hard work. Huh. Um, acting is not hard work. Acting is, you know, if you're lucky enough to be sitting at a table like this, uh, it, it, you've been very lucky in your life. Um, you caught the brass ring somewhere along the way. Um, I've known a tremendous amount of talented actors who didn't get opportunities. So. Uh, Luck is, is, has always been a huge part of what it is we do, so I always consider myself and people, my friends who work, uh, to have an element of luck along the way. And so, is it hard work? Certainly, there's, it's long hours. Nobody wants to hear you complain. I mean, I remember I was selling women's shoes at a department store, which is a lousy job. It sounds like it'd be great, but it's just, you know, it, it wasn't like elegant shoes. It was, you know, 80-year-old women like, that's a hammer toe, you know, and you're like, no, I don't want to see that. And I, I remember thinking people would, I would hear of famous stars complaining in Hollywood about how hard their life was. And I thought, you know, I didn't want to hear that. So no, I, I don't find it, uh, I don't find it difficult. I find it challenging, and sometimes I'm very bad at it, but I don't find it necessarily hard. Do you think you were bad and have become better? I think scripts make people better. Uh, I think directions, directions. direction makes people better. Mm -hmm. You know, you can find a lot of projects where actors were tremendously good in one project and you'll see them not work necessarily well in others. I think scripts make a huge difference in that department. Can the editing create a performance? And you've directed and edited. Yes, editing can absolutely help help a performance. Right. By eliminating it if it's bad. Uh, that's right. Well, well you know. Isn't, <laughs> isn't the famous story, wasn't it um, Mercedes McCambridge, a giant or something? She, they, they edited the scene and played it all on her. She didn't have a word to say and she won the Academy Award. It was in a Network, right? Was it Network? Yeah. No. It, I thought uh, it was a giant. Yeah, maybe it was. But, uh, Beatrice Strait in Beatrice Strait, right. right, yes. right, right, right. Mm. How did you end up cutting tobacco? I grew up in Kentucky. That was what oh. you did in the summers. I mean, really? that's how you made your living, three bucks an hour. Hmm. But, uh, you know, that's what everybody did. You know, that's how did you, you know it. then you wanted to act? I figured it out right after I finished cutting tobacco. <laughs> <laughs> My uncle was an actor named Jose Ferrer, yeah. and he'd come to Kentucky. I'd never met him. And he came to Kentucky to do a movie when I was... 20 years old, uh, with his son Miguel Ferrer, mm. also a wonderful actor. And I didn't really know either of them very well. I knew Miguel a little bit. And I was very enchanted with the idea of Hollywood because I'd grown up in sort of a small town in Kentucky. And, uh, and I went and I was an extra for about two months uh, on, the, on the set. They got me a gig. And then Jose said, Yada, go to Hollywood and be an actor. And I said, Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and then I got lucky. The but way. the thing is, you know, if you're in, in a whole life of an actor, if you go through periods where you're not working, that would be the hard part. Mm, sure. You know, having the job and having something to do, that's the good part. But, you know, for a whole career, everybody goes through ups and downs. Mm. So when you go through years and you're not getting anything, it becomes difficult like it would in any job mm -hmm. when you're not getting anything. What's the longest you've gone without working? Um, well, I, I'm... 
I'm not a good person to ask because I've run at a extraordinarily slow pace my whole life. Because I've made my own films, you know, each one of those takes three years. So, uh, so you know, I, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've always been working. I've always been writing. So, but I've had no checks for two and a half years. Yeah. You know, writing on spec, trying to get a movie financed. Nothing coming in for. Nick, you were two years. you did big Hollywood films, and at some point you chose to walk away from that. Why? Well. It was obvious I wasn't going to get any more roles, you know. I could see it coming. Um, it, I just got uncomfortable with the budgets. You know, it started out uh, 10, 15 million was a big budget, then 20, 30 million, and then 40 million, and then 50 million. And it started getting up there that it just didn't feel comfortable. And the scripts weren't getting any better. In fact, uh, the, the the bigger the the, the uh, budget, the worse the script. Yeah. It seemed to follow hand in hand, and uh, it, the better work was in the independents. While the independents were still operating, uh, you know, we could raise money like ten million dollars pretty easy for independence and, and and do whatever you want. I, when I was working with uh, Paul Schrader, he had a momentary outrage with the, we were in the bar across the street from where we were shooting in another bar, and we had a glass of wine, and Schrader was going, uh, boy, I, I, I want to do one of those $100 million films. I, 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 you know, I, I'm not really doing my work unless I do a $100 million film. I said, Paul, you know, you're just full of it. I mean, you, you, here, you've got, you, you got to pick the script, you got to pick your cast, you got to pick everything, all down the line. You, you'll never have it more control than you have right here. And yet you want to get in one of those nightmarish hundred million dollar collaborative effort of decision making, <laughs> not by you, you know, and not by the director certainly, you know. So it just it looked like it was going to get more nightmarish, you know. He was hoping Pixar would make Taxi Driver. <laughs> <laughs> was, was, there, was it a gradual decision? Or was there one film you did where you thought, this is it, I want to change? Well, you know, I, I am very fortunate. I was able to do some films that I suggested. You know, like 48 hour, uh, North Dallas 40. I actually didn't want to do 48 hours. Uh, they kept saying that the black kid wasn't funny. So, uh, you know, <laughs> to this day, Katzenberg is afraid I'll, I'll blurt out who it was. But, uh, I won't. I won't get my Christmas bonus. <laughs> yeah. so what's the worst point in your acting career? Has there been a, a really low moment in your it, life? It's kind of daily. Really? Yeah. Why? I don't know. I, I live with uh, death lately. Because I'm 70, you know, and after after 70, you know, you don't think about sex much anymore. You think about wait till death. you're 80. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you. I was waiting for that. You didn't tie it in the lair, <laughs> so I. <laughs> what do you think about at 80? Uh, don't don't go into it. No, I won't. <laughs> we, uh, we it's a leave it leave it leave it as a surprise. Yeah. Yeah. Does, does Getting older change your perception of the roles you choose or the work you want to do. You're talking to me? <laughs> no, it's I'm, I've, I'm working more than I've ever worked in my yeah, life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's unbelievable. I don't know what's something. Either <clears throat> there's only me left in the 80s, but I think there's some other people who must be 80 even who act. But uh, I, I don't know. I'm having an absolute ball. Yeah. I really am. I've, I've never been happier. That's the coolest, that's the best thing I've heard in about yeah. two years, thank you. <laughs> Chris, it is straight. You, you found success, I mean global success, relatively late. Relatively. Um, were, were things hard for you before that? Yep. Not always, but it was the, the, the same story. That's, that's not a specifically American story. That's, um, 
in all in all the cultures that I know, the actor has ups and downs. That's uh, the nature of the beast. So I had ups and downs on a smaller level, mm. and <laughs> they were ups and downs and ups and downs. And then the ups were smaller, but the downs must have been. I mean, in Europe they don't pay a lot. Well, the, but but consistently, you can. I mean, especially in the German-speaking area, you can, you know be a member of a theater company and, and do that for, I mean, I know my, my grandparents did it in one theater for their whole careers. You can work several films at a time, too. I saw that a lot in Jefferson and Paris. I mean, they'd get out of their clothes and, and then they'd go down to Italy, pick up the film they were doing in Italy, come back to Paris. Pick up. Yeah, exactly. Pick so, up. so it's it's possibly more secure and more consistent. But if you're not really buying into that uh, consistency, because the, the a certain degree of consistency brings a certain degree of mediocrity, mm. um, then you know, you you expose yourself to the ups and downs. But still, you know, the the whole social social uh, backup is uh, you know from from the, the the very system is is far more secure so um, being unemployed for nine months is not a life-threatening experience one thing i remember two years ago when you did the round table for bastards you had said you were looking forward to the opportunities that were coming from the success of the film now two years later having done some more you know, global more americanized films how had those roles changed you and how how do you how are you finding working in a different system well, um, it, it, that's one thing that I said to one of my colleagues um, before we started uh, *Inglorious Bastards* in in, in Berlin. Uh, Sylvester Grote played uh, Goebbels in the, in the movie, and he's about my age. And we were standing there in front of the in front of the studio, and we both said, "Well, here we are." <laughs> and then we both said, "Yep, but we're not going to do much." Different than we have for the past 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, how has it changed me? Yeah, it made you know made life certainly more exciting and certain parts more enjoyable and and more interesting. But you know, that's what where where uh, success late in a career comes in very handy because it's a it's great, it's lovely. So I enjoy it. But best and worst uh, thing about being a star. Well, I think, I, he's talking about what Christoph is talking about, there's an interesting thing when, you, you know, for me it was relatively later, I'd been on so many failed television series for such a long time. Um, you know, my aunt was a really talented singer, you know, Rosemary Clooney. In 1950 she was on the cover of every magazine, she was a big hit. And then rock and roll came in and women singers, nine of the top ten singers were women then, were all gone. I mean, it was all, it became a male dominant, dominated, uh, Thing. And she was gone, and she was on the road. And people started saying, what happened to you? Where'd you go? And, and she's like, I'm here, I'm singing, I'm doing my thing, and what the fuck are you talking about? And she was gone for 20 years. And it, because she was so young, she was 19 when it first happened, she sort of believed all that shit that you would believe if you're 19, where people tell you how brilliant you are and how good you are, and all, all of those things. So that meant now she clearly wasn't. When, of course, she didn't become less of a singer along the way, but things change, the elements change. So, you know, later on she came back, she had an unbelievably great sort of renaissance of a career. And it was I never thought she went away, John. Yeah, I know, she did, though. <laughs> yeah, 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 she was one of my favorites. She was yeah, one of the greats. But, yeah. but she was gone for 20 years, she couldn't get a job. I mean, no. I mean, literally, could, Bing Crosby gave her a job 20 years later, and she had, she had you know, some drug issues, you know, prescription drug Baby things. Babysitting, right? Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. And so suddenly, you know, for, for me that was always the, the understanding later in life, getting uh, success after I'd failed so many times, you have a, a much easier understanding of how, you know, at the end of the day you're all on a different couch and it's Ralph Edwards mm -hmm. doing this is your life and you're sitting here like this and you're like, you know, everything was going great and then tragedy struck and you're like, you know. And we understand that a little bit better and I think that's the great thing about those, uh, what you were talking about, I think is really important, is that this is a journey that we all get to go on, and it's not, it doesn't, it's not a constant move like this. It's a constant, and it's how you handle this, <coughs> the down part, and it's much better to happen. Are when you afraid of the down? Are you afraid of failure? 
I think I think all of us are know. afraid of failure. Mm -hmm. You know, of course. I don't think the downside is about failure. The downside is about not working. It's just you know, it's, 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 you can't find work. You know, and, that, and that's pretty spooky. Uh, I mean, you know, I I reach out and I, I do a, Euro, a European film one a year. You know, I just did one in uh, in Spain, but I was only person that could speak English, the rest could only speak Spanish. There was something wrong with them. Uh, <laughs> they, they were saying the same about you. Yeah, yeah, I know it. I, know it. Uh, I, I, I can't remember who was all in it, but you'd recognize the people. I mean, I did. Uh, uh, but it was, a, it, was, it was a great experience. Now, if I had stayed home with no work, then I would have been in the shitter. Yeah. But you know, but the truth is, you know, without turning this into a men's group, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, well, it is a men's group. Well, I know, but I'm talking, you know, it, it <laughs> not, 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 no, feel comfortable. no, no, <laughs> no, sir, it was only once and I was drunk. <laughs> 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 I, I was doing Lear. <laughs> <laughs> I had so much time off. <laughs> you know, you are who you are no matter what happens to you. And when, when you go to sleep at night, that's your brain is it, it, the star thing, the not a star thing. That they, it means nothing to your, to your soul. Your soul doesn't go, oh, you're a star. <laughs> you know, all that stuff that, that was yeah, buried so deep is, is, is gone. <laughs> so, so the thing is, I, I, I think you know, my father was a, a, radio, a famous radio comedian. And he was very ill, and he died when I was young. And I think before I really comprehended anything, I saw that this stuff had no meaning. He was paralyzed. You know, he didn't care about people going, oh, I love your radio show. He could barely get out of a chair. And so, you know, and famous people would come to the house and you'd have an instinct like, would you want to spend two weeks with Milton Berle and a, on a boat? I don't know that you would, you know? So I, I, I just, I think it's something that doesn't, pe people think that exterior success changes but your demons are your demons and they're only sort of ma magnified so I I mean you know the person who I would admire clears that stuff up and then if they're in a hit movie good for them you know that's that's all have you had any great role model any here any person who's really influenced you you can say it <laughs> <laughs> other than George I I I loved and I loved Jack Benny the yeah. most of anybody and and Jack Benny did something when I was very young that showed that showed me more about how to live a life in this business I was on a tonight show early on in my career and I did this bit I even remember it it was a Alberto and his elephant bimbo. It was a European elephant trainer, and the elephant didn't make it. They were in Chicago the night before, so he had to do the show, and he did it with a live frog, beating him like an elephant and throwing him <laughs> peanuts. And and uh, and Jack Benny was on. And when they went away for the last break, Jack Benny leaned over to Johnny Carson and said. When we come back, ask me where I'm gonna where I'm gonna be performing, will you? And you know, Johnny Carson, sure. So they came back. They were saying good night, and Johnny said to Jack, Jack, where are you gonna be performing? And Jack said, Never mind about me. That's the funniest kid I've ever seen. <laughs> and I thought, you know, it's like, look what he did. He set that up to make a compliment. It was, you know, oh, so you can be brilliant and gracious. They go together. That's fantastic. So I, I, I loved him. Who most influenced you growing up um, in England? Well, my mother, really, mm. because my mother brought me up from the age of seven. Uh, I, she, she's a, a, a hero of mine, really, because but she's 92, still gets around. She lives here. I moved her out, um, and. Uh, so, you know, life after 80 for, for, for my mom is, and, and you know what, and still takes the bus and um, will call me from the end of the, you know, and I said, I'll come and pick you up. <laughs> but, but she's very, still very, luckily, she's independent. 
I've never heard my mother say, poor me. Yeah. Mm. And yeah. I, yeah. I, she was shooting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're doing well. She got up around. She got swimming. She doesn't want to she take got, up. No, but no. Gary, that please. <laughs> <laughs> no, you yeah. have I'm at the bus station. <laughs> I'm at yeah, the, the end of the street. <laughs> I'll be there in about an hour and a half. You're a shooter. Anything. She used to do a. The, the big tapestries, and um, and then and then was it and then was it, you know, met my father and was in the in the Royal Navy in the war and became you know a housewife, um, and uh, and then when I was uh, about six or seven, he um, he ran off with his best friend's wife. It happens, and. Uh, and uh, so she, uh, my, I have uh, older sisters who had flown the coop. So I was uh, es essentially an only child. And um, but that, she was a, a she's a great inspiration. You're very lucky to have, have a mom in 92. Yeah, I lost mine in 86. And that was the last parent. Yeah. Problem with that is that when that last parent dies, you call your sister or your brother if you have one. And you say, how old are you? And whichever one's your oldest, that's the next one that goes. <laughs> you know, but it's not going to work out that way, I don't think. My sister's two years older than me, and but I think... But you're getting the most calls? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. When did you decide you were going to act? I saw um, a, probably a movie now that won't... Doesn't, Stand the test of time. A film by Brian Forbes. Oh God, yes. Yeah, yeah, called The Raging Moon, <laughs> and um, with Malcolm McDowell in it. A young, a very young Malcolm McDowell. And it was like, um, I think, you know, there's a sort of a, a moment of what alcoholics talk about, the, the moment of clarity, or the, you know, it was, it was, it was like, I want to do that. Uh, I'd never, I'd never been in school plays, or oh, I, I would, I would mimic as a kid, and and I, I guess I had a party piece, you know, but um, but I'd never, never was in, in the never, never in, in plays at school, and I just saw this thing one night and went, I want to do that. How old were you? Then? Uh, f fifteen. Mm. Really, that's early. Well, um, yeah. What was it? Why? What did you want? What appealed to you? It was. Uh, it was just the, the his. There was a sort of. Um, th there's a sort of mix. I mean, now I can. In hindsight, I guess it was a sort of. Was this incredible? He had a mixture of. It was sort of vulnerability and menace. There was just this. Mm. It, 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 about him. And I, and just sort of then announced, you know, <laughs> I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask you a question? Instead of a, instead of a, you know, instead of a criminal, which is <laughs> an option. At that <laughs> <point>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, the next best thing. The next best thing. Good close. And did did you know Malcolm McDowell before? I mean, of him? Have you seen movies with him before? That was the first thing that, I'd that seen. That was the first thing. And then thing. I saw. If, if and Clockwork Orange, right. and, and then sort of, but, but that was the first thing I'd seen. So, and and have you heard about him, read about him, or known? Nothing. Because I'm, what, I'm, what I'm interested in is yeah. whether it was the, the celebrity that you found attracted. No, uh, attracted. It was just this character. He was, he was uh, it, it, he's um, a bit of a lad, a bit of a womanizer, a bit of a drinker. And he's a, um, a, the a opening of the movie is in play, he's playing soccer. And he becomes paralyzed, and uh, and has to go into a sort of like a, a, a cope with being in a wheelchair. And it was just this, mm. uh, yeah, just this <coughs> character. I was just draw, drawn to the what drawn to the character. Before that, what had you thought you might do? Um, well, I wanted to be a cameraman, and I and we had a thing at school which. 
Did, did you have something here like a careers officer? They used to call them the careers officer. Guidance counselor. The guide and guidance counselor. <laughs> That's counselor. what it's called. Yeah. 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 And, I went, and I went and said that I, I, I'm quite fancy being a cameraman. And they looked at me like I was you know, from, a, from another planet. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's funny. I mean, I, I got, I guess my, my break mm. came with, a uh, movie break came with Sid and Nancy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I had been Bravo. 10, 9, 10 years, you know, be before mm -hmm. that, a good seven years in the theatre. And um, I've been acting now 30, 31 years. Mm -hmm. And you were talking earlier about careers, you know. It's, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm 53 and I'm sitting here. It's the first time I've sat here. Mm -hmm. And I'm, Loving every minute. <laughs> <laughs> if your mom so, needs a ride, I go yeah. up through Fairfax. <laughs> I go home through Fairfax. Right. Did, here, did you? Did you? You know, I did. I did. Uh, Brighton Way. You know Brighton Way up there. Yeah. I did. Uh, I did the play at Steppenwolf, uh, Vicious, which Alex Cox came to see when and, and was working on when they were doing really? Sid and Nancy. Really. And the guy John Snyder, who played, uh, I think your agent in the movie, was the guy who'd played Sid what, in the what's play. The guy who played in the play. Yeah. 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 Yes, yeah, so I, I, I saw that. Did you very train early. as an actor? Yeah. Where? Rose Bruford. Three years. It's all the, the usual. Uh, did it make a difference? Yeah. <gasps> yeah. What well, about the rest? You, Chris, yeah, did you have? Be a discipline. Yeah. It, 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 does Does the training help? Yes. Mm -hmm. It does. Well, well, yeah. well, well what training did you have? Just the, the theatre, of course, I had because mm -hmm. the theatre is what it's to me is what it is what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you get trained just by doing it. The audience tells you how good you are. Mm. And they'll laugh if they think it's funny. And if they don't, you, you look very, learn very quickly that it's very embarrassing if they... <coughs> that is your partner, the, the audience. It's your partner. Mm. And even if you're playing to a very beautiful girl, you still are, are whoring a little bit because the audience is the important part. And that's extraordinary training. So I try to get back as much as I can to, doesn't do me any good, but I can't. I mean, I try for the, 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 the theater. Mm -hmm. yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. there isn't that in the United States. We, we don't have that kind of tradition that the English have that has the repertory companies that you can go into and the kind yeah. of training. You have to kind of seek it out on your own. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a lot of theater in the United States. There's a ton of it. Uh, but you you have to go find it. Yeah, Usually you, to universities, but you can go out and have your own little circuit. I had a circuit that ran the uh, uh, Little Theater of the Rockies in Greeley, Colorado, which I was a guest artist. And then um, a stock equity company called the Old Log Theater in Excelsior, Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was... Uh, Actors in their circle in Phoenix, Arizona. Then there's a couple of companies in San Francisco, and uh, you just run a circuit and yeah. you add to that and, and take from that. And if you go into New York, I'd never go to New York except to audit classes because I did not want to get stuck in classes, and I just didn't see the benefit of that. What's the best advice or the worst advice somebody's given you? best advice is to do theater. Do the roles you need to do when you need to do them. Yeah. And pursue that no matter what the arena. And then get a, if you're going to go to one of these places like New York <laughs> or LA, for God's sake, get an invitation. <laughs> you know, it's much easier than yeah. to go and try to knock That's an interesting thing that happens now when you, when you work with younger actors, because, you know, even in LA, there was actually a very lively theater. You know, it was all equity waiver. But you go down Melrose, and there was 15 mm -hmm. theaters going on. You could go from theater work from theater to theater, and, and you, you know, it, some of it was really bad theater. But you got a, a, a lesson in sort of taking a character from the beginning to the end in a, in an hour and a half <coughs> or two hours in a two or three act play. And sometimes when you you work with younger actors now who haven't done theater because most of them haven't now. They, they've gotten famous quickly. Yeah. When you talk to them, they'll go, well, uh, they, they'll try to, win, like when you're directing them, they will try to win every scene. 
every single scene they're in, they'll try to, to, to win. And you go, you have to lose some scenes <laughs> because you're going to win in the end. And in order to get that, and that through line sometimes is a very interesting thing because you have to say, if you'd done the theater, you'd go, well, no, I'm not, I'm not going to cry in these first next two scenes because I'm going to really lay it on at the end and get, you know, and have earned it. And it's an interesting thing watching the actual benefits of what you all are talking about, which is that theater, you know, people love to say, oh, you know, you did a theater and, you know, you, that's, that's that and you want to talk about it. But there really is a, uh, there, it is beneficial in film acting as well. It makes a difference in the way you work. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I can't imagine how how one understands whether something is really funny, what the timing of it is without an audience. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you learn yeah. from the yeah. audience. Cool. Has, you learn what's has dramatic, direct, what's funny. Has directing changed your acting? Has directing changed your acting? Well, <clears throat> I, I started as an actor before I became a director, but you know, I, I went to Carnegie Tech, which was only the, which was a theater mm -hmm. school. And it was an amazing opportunity because you were taking mime with this man, Jewel Walker, and dance with Paul Draper, and you, you yeah. know, you did everything. You and took then mime. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and then I went and I did two years of summer stock at, at uh, Priscilla Beach Theater, and you did, you know, 16 parts. And, yeah, it was a and, great time. And, and that's, and anything that you do, helps you as an actor, anything. Mm -hmm. A trip you take to Spain will help you as an actor, any experience, but especially physical, you know, stretching your body and, and, and doing something that, well, I'm, I'm never going to fence, but somehow you'll, you know, you use it. So uh, I work as a director, I work with actors from an actor's point of view. So. I, uh, I'm more concerned with how, you know, that communication's doing, I think, than I'm communicating with the cinematographer. I have to hope the cinematographer's doing the right job. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned if you're in the scene, how you're doing. And, and that's, I think there are some directors who like the picture more than the person. Mm -hmm. But I... I but like I'm wondering if the experience of directing for both of you has impacted the way you go you go about acting you're more you are more direct you are you you are you simplify a lot of the things you get quicker to the answer uh, as an actor a lot because you'll understand um, you know a lot of times there's this weird dance that directors and actors have to play you know the, the director is basically trying to manipulate the actor into doing what he wants what he has seen the picture to be but, but yes but right but, but then the actor but you want to the actor likes to think that it was his idea. Right. So it's a, so <laughs> that's what I mean. So it's this manipulation because the actor then is trying to manipulate the director into doing yeah. what he always thought. And but, there's this weird you're, dance. You're not, you're not, when you're acting only, you're not directing. No, you're not. But you are. All actors have a, a, some idea of what the scene is going to be that is always never going to be quite what the director thinks in right. general. Right. And you're going to go, and I've worked with you, I've seen you. I see what you do. You know, <laughs> Albert is very, but actors will, you know, we'll work with each other. We've worked together and right, right, there's, right. they'll be like, well, maybe if I did this and the director sort of wouldn't want us to do those things like Soderbergh and I, we did a scene together, a few scenes together with Steven Soderbergh and we have ideas and Steven really didn't want us to do those things. Right, but because we asked him to stay out of the room when the camera rolled. <laughs> that was very insulting. He was insulting. He seemed insulting. You go home, you come back, we'll, we'll be here. here. We'll do it. But there's always this sort of game, you know, and part of it is this, this little dance you do. And sometimes being an actor and having been an actor and then directing, there is some understanding of a shortcut where I'll go, I know what you want. And how about we just go, and you can find a shorter version of that than having to do the dance that a director, just only director and actor do, a lot of times, not I, always. I read this really interesting article yesterday uh, written by a, a psychologist, a cognitive by behavioral psychologist, Daniel Kahneman, and he puts this thing 
down to the illusion of validity, he calls it. I read that that. Yeah. Everybody, everybody, you know, is so convinced about the the the, the validity of their of their approach, of their actions, of their their um, opinion, right. and be so confident about their decisions. It's a complete illusion. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's really more or less a confidence. Uh, of communicating mm -hmm. your point than being right or wrong. Are mm -hmm. you confident generally or has your confidence changed with success? Yes, it has. Mm. Um, I don't know exactly how and I don't know exactly on what level it has changed because I have felt for a long time <laughs> something that everybody experiences, a certain, certain degree of being misplaced. Because I always had the feeling, yeah, well, you know, it, it's all right what I'm doing, and I, I know why I'm doing it. And another, you know, illusion of validity. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but but nobody seems to really want it enough, or not enough people want it for me to make headway. And so success actually, um, in in a way, pushed that illusion of validity into a slightly different and more satisfying direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you like your work when you see it, or, you, or you generally I don't see it. You don't. N not not regularly. You know, certain things I avoid, and and certain things I. Do I you go back and see old things you've done? No, never. 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 Do, do you? Do you do no, it? No, I think it's healthy sometimes. You know, and I, I so someone said, you know, what do you think about you know the, all the roles that you played mm. and thing, and and I I very. I flippantly sort of said, oh well, I I I just stamp most of it to the ground. But I don't mean that in a I, I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. It's just just it's it's old work. Some of it's good, some of it stinks, and <laughs> and you know what does tomorrow bring? Mm. No, I can't. Christopher, what makes the great actor? You're asking me that. Well, let me tell you. I'm <laughs> <laughs> a good man. And you are a great actor, so you, you, can, you can speak on the subject. What's the crucial element that makes a great actor? Not a good actor, a great actor. Good Lord. Well, I think, um, in my experience of watching great acting, uh, it's always been someone who has, who has the great rage. I think the great rage is... is uh, one that shakes them to their boots and if <clears throat> you're capable of that and I think I've seen a few actors who have done that. What Actually, do Mr. Oldman knows something What do you mean by the great rage? You do. You, you, uh, the great rage, the great temper. Someone who can lose their temper suddenly very quickly and frighten the shit, not just out of the person he's playing with, but the audience as well. It's the rage. Hmm. And then, and then the, uh, the ability to, to make the classic roles seem so modern and so fresh. Um, that's, that's the, yeah. Yeah, otherwise I, I, I don't know what I mean, to... I want, I want to come to that. Do you agree that, yeah, that you have I, the great I rage? I, 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 uh, he does. He does? I think Do a you? few ex-wives would... would <laughs> 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 Fifteen minutes before we started, he was yelling at the hand. <laughs> it's such, it, 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 but I, it, it's such an interesting definition of so unexpected. See, I think, uh, not just because we're here, but, but, mm. but Mr. Clooney here can give you, he can give you Michael Clayton, mm -hmm. and then he can do, uh, oh brother, where are they? Mm. And that's, I think, you know, that's, 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 that's uh, you know, you're a great actor. That's a range, uh, that is isn't it? Great it's a different range. Thing. You know, do you, that, that George, do you agree with, with Christopher? I, I, well, I, I, li I liked what he said because there is a, there's an element of that that you'll see even in comedy, you'll see that kind of rage. It, do it doesn't have to be oh, angry. No, no, right. no, do you know, it has to be, you know, watch Joel McRae in, uh, you know, in Sullivan's Travels mm -hmm. and there is still this mm -hmm. sort of throbbing yes. undercurrent that's always going around. Um, I think that there's some real truth in what he said and I think that's what's fun about sitting Albert on this couch. Has that, I think too. I've certainly seen Mr. Nolte Mm -hmm. I think it's something Rotten else. I think it's, some, I think it's an additional thing also, especially in movies, because in theater it's, it's different, but in movies because you're large and the camera is mm. close to you. And I, I can't describe it perfectly, but the actors that 
have always been the most affecting to me are the ones that allow me to interpret on my own. And there are some actors that give you a hundred percent, they don't let you get in. They're, oh, they're working. You see them working. And there are other actors that instinctively lay back, and it's really like a painting, you know? I mean, why should, why should any modern artist sell for hundreds of millions of dollars? It's only because people are standing there and they're thinking of what, what, what does this mean to them? And the same thing happens with a, with a good actor, and that's that they allow you to fill in the blanks. And no. I, I, don't, I wouldn't know how to teach somebody that, but I think, you know, you take someone like Spencer Tracy, mm -hmm. who just did it. He just woke up and he did it. And even Jimmy Stewart. I'm just thinking of older, yeah, no, great no, no. actors. But can I ask you a question? Yes. The blanks of what? What? The blanks of what? Fill in the blanks of what? The blanks of the rest of your character that you're, that you're not responsible for. That's exactly what, what I'm driving at, because that's one thing that I meant to ask you before. When you were fascinated by the character, um, um, what, what, what was it? You it know, had to let his imagination go. It had, to, it had to be something that he did that you took and extended. So yeah. You, yeah. To, yeah. to put yourself as the spectator into the story. Or to say, that's my uncle. Or to, you know, to be able to take it that nth degree that you can't do, you can fill in the character 90%, but, there, but you know, if you lay back and I allow you to say, Jesus, he reminds me of my brother, instead of being so, you know, I'm so this that there's no interpretation left. Yeah. No, there are people. Good, good singers will do that. Watch a good singer. Oh. oh. You listen to a. You, I used to say to Rosemary, she was 70 years old, and I said, you can't hit any of the notes you used to hit. You can't hold any of the notes you used to hold. Why are you a better singer? She goes, I don't have to prove I can sing anymore. It's, I just serve the material and, yes. and, and let the work, let the maybe good material, let's hope, everybody else is good, and let everybody else sort of participate so in I a way. I agree totally, because I think, you know, great, actor, great actors are, owe their greatness a lot to the parts that they play. Mm -hmm. Oh, but yeah. aren't you talking about some fundamental mystery that <coughs> people have on the screen? In other words, is that something you can create by choice? Well, it, or is it just something no, you No, it have? is a mystery. I mean, you've got two people on a screen, and you want to watch that person more than you want to watch the other one. That you can't explain. Right. That's, mm -hmm. If there's any mystery, and I know people wax lyrical about acting in my third eye, and they talk about all this. <laughs> they talk about such rubbish about acting. But if there's any mystique to it, it's talent. Yeah. It's harder yeah. to keep that alive. In the modern world of show business, where you you have to go front and center and yeah. sell everything you're yeah. doing. And there's less mystery. In there's the no mystery. Right. No, no, but, no, no, you know, no. you can still have it as a person. I mean, I you know, there's people who know me very well, but they're not 100% sure what I'm thinking when I'm looking at them. So, you know, <laughs> I can talk to them all day long. <laughs> they're still not sure. So that's that's the, that's in me, but it, it, the mist, you know, to me, movies would all be better if nobody ever saw the actors ever, except on screen. Uh, I, it, it would be way better. It would just make them all more fascinating. I don't want to see everybody on David Letterman and then go no. see the movie. But you know, that's the world we live in. What's the most in you say about all the rubbish people said about acting? What's the most interesting thing somebody said about acting? But I have to say, I thought what. You just said was really interesting uh, about the, right. the rage. But what's the most interesting thing somebody said about acting? I think the most concise way I've ever, I, I personally have ever heard it, heard it put. I think it was, um, and I've not, I don't, I've not read any of this stuff. But Meisner, the acting, mm -hmm. who yeah, said, yeah, yeah, but he said that acting was it was living under imaginary circumstances. And I thought that was. For me, I, I connected with that. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a very, a very eloquent, very simple, direct way of putting it. So then, if you living think truthfully, oh, living truthfully—that's a, a totally different thing. Yeah, living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Mm. I, 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 I mean, I've never met anyone who actually becomes the character. 
I've never met I mean, many people who claim to have a copy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Except in an institution. Exactly. You sure you don't want to take the Chuck Manson role? <laughs> <laughs> do you feel I'll sometimes? Do you wonder if if, if acting is meaningful? If it's if it's a worthwhile job? Um, I was actually very struck when the first when, when the second George Bush was president, when he said, you know, after 9/11, he suddenly felt he understood why he was president. I was kind of worried that he didn't understand that when he ran for president. That's right. <laughs> but I wondered if, it's like he suddenly felt, oh, I understand there is meaning to what I'm doing now. Do you, f do you feel that your work is meaningful in the grand scheme of things? Is anything meaningful in the grand scheme? Oh, what? <laughs> oh yes, I, I, think, uh, I think it is. Mm -hmm. I, I think people we can give... People want to see what people yeah, do. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. uh, there will always yeah. be, even when the holograms and everything have mm -hmm. been destroyed and it's boring in the screen, there will always be a mystery of one man walking onto an empty stage that fascinates an audience. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, when, I mean, when, don't remind me, when you pass on, I've got a good part for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a hologram. it's a hologram thing and yeah. we're just, we're just yeah. writing. Do you have any regrets? It's an honor to have, honor to have you here. And you know, not really, not really, honestly. There are a couple of parts I think I'd li like to have played, in a, which I didn't get. But, uh, which one in particular? Um, yes, I, I, I made a, a little success in London in, a, in Beckett, the play about Beckett and uh, King Henry II. And I was furious when old Peter O'Toole, my friend, got it. <laughs> son, of a, <laughs> son of a bitch. What did he do? What? What did he do this time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, you have to qualify meaningful. I mean, if you're really talking in the grand scheme mm -hmm. of things, people love to see acting, it, en it enhances their imagination. If, God forbid, a nuclear weapon dropped, y I don't think the actors are going to be the first responders, you know? <laughs> you know yeah. Quickly, let me do a monologue for you. Yeah. So, I mean, in the grand scheme of things... Oh, well, there'll I, be a couple. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's where mine's going to come yeah, in. Exactly. <laughs> but, you know, but uh, in, a, in a normal functioning society, uh, adding to people's imagination is a is a lovely profession. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. I I think if we could come up with something to cure cancer, I don't know that the two would be. It's it's a different. It's a you know. It's no, but off, we could keep the do doctor laughing while he's inventing. Something. Well, <laughs> you know, maybe maybe we, so. We, maybe we so. Are I just know. I just don't. <laughs> sometimes I just you know don't know, don't think that any. I, I'm, I'm always aware every day that, what is there, six billion people and five billion nine hundred and ninety-nine million and nine hundred and ninety-eight or seven, my wife and my two children, don't give a shit about me, you know, and, and I don't really mean that much to them. I'm just aware of that. It's, uh, I don't think... I don't think it's necessarily... That, but I think you, there, is a, there is an important value in entertainment. I think there is an important value in... Uh, something to distract people from their lives. If you look at times, uh, the Great Depression is one of the biggest booms in movie history, you know. People do need an escape, and there is a, a, a something provided by it. I don't make, I think that uh, that makes it necessarily royalty. I just think it's a one very nice function of society. That, but it's you know, interesting that's the way you define it, because when I look at the films that you've directed and some that you starred in, mm -hmm. they're not just escapes, they're pretty challenging. Uh, good Night and Good Luck is not what you think of as escapist entertainment. But I don't, I, I, I think that there's, it's still an entertainment. It's, mm -hmm. you know, I, I don't get to make policy when I play a guy running yeah. for president. You know, I, I actually just, you know, uh, you know, films in general, we can't lead the way. People a lot of times will say you're trying to lead society. It takes you two years. You know, something happens, it takes you a year to write the screenplay. If you're lucky, a year to get it done and out. So we're, we're usually reflective of that. And sometimes there's periods of time in society, society you can look from the mid-60s to the mid-70s, in particular American films, uh, where we were ref reflecting the you know civil rights movement and the women's rights movement, the drug counterculture and the anti-Vietnam. You know we were reflecting those things. We were talking about those, and that that was something that the country was conscious of and was talking about. And then we got away from that probably after Watergate-ish, and and that then we started looking for something to entertain more and 
challenge less. Well, particularly now, it's gotten so black. Right. Yeah, but, I'd rather but, live in my imagination. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather live but, in but, your imagination. But, but no, nobody, nobody wants to live in a world without art. That would be a terrible world. But I think I was taking you literally because what is reality television? Reality television is bad acting. So, in other words, if all the actors died, there'd still be plays, they'd just be bad. <laughs> right. If all the scientists died, nobody would cure anything. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know, you could act yourself. You might be bad. My neighbor could do Lear. I don't want to see it. Have you but ever thought of doing something other than acting, directing? And if so, what? I wanted to be an eye doctor for a, a few years when I was... Did in, you? Yes. Chris, what about you? Yeah, no, I oh. started uh, studying the classics uh, as a pianist. Do you still I, play? When, when drunk, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and what's your favorite I'm piano? What's your, what's your favorite piano? It's a theme of his house. It's a theme of her piano. Oh, my God. Uh, Can I go home with you? Yeah. <laughs> yes, darling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you have more fun than I do. <laughs> it's a piece by Ravel, and I'm, I'm, I've dried now. This <laughs> son of a bitch took over. I'll, I'll think about it and let you know. Mm. Nick, how about you? <laughs> oh, no. It just no. I, I wouldn't know what to do. Uh, you know, a lot of what we're discussing was the decision of whether to be in real life or not. <laughs> yes. And I certainly preferred not to be in real life. Yes. It was <laughs> horrifying. <laughs> yes, uh, horrifying. Cold War. <laughs> Bunkers and all that kind of shit that was laid on us as kids of just not any place I wanted to be. So I felt at home when I hit the stage, just absolutely at home. Yeah. Even though it was the most horrific experience you could possibly have, you're standing there in the wings going, why would you do this to yourself? <laughs> why would you just go out and terrify yourself by fucking? you know, fucking up. You don't know if you're not going to or not. It's the most horrific experience opening night. But I prefer that to uh, the horror of real life, mm -hmm. which is not pretty, you know, it's not really a horror unless your brain accepts it as that. But that's the way it was projected Nick, to us. You, that's you, what the you reality got a title was. for your autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> what, horror of real life? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I buy it. <laughs> Uh, I think it was my fifth wife. Who's <laughs> <laughs> Your fifth wife? That's kind of a lot. Horror. No, horror. <laughs> the horror. Yeah. The horror. Oh, 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 oh. Horror. Horror. Yes. Horror. Is there any work that, that any of you have done that you really think has had an influence <laughs> on people's lives or socially? Is there one work really that you think this one actually did have an effect on society? No. No. There is one, Lorenzo's Oil. I mean, I saw it in New Science, a uh, British science magazine. Lorenzo's Oil really works. <laughs> that was after 20 years. The doctor held out and said, well, if Lorenzo lives past 30, then I'll believe that it works. And he lived to 32. <laughs> so I said, Lorenzo's Oil. Now, I don't know how many people that affected Lorenzo, I guess. <laughs> is there a film that's really changed you personally, that one film that's really stamped you as an individual, changed your life, Gary? You mentioned the Malcolm McDowell film, anything else? That, that I, that, that, you're not, uh, one I did or one no, I did? No, another one that, oh. that has really impacted you. I mean, there's so, that I, I, I couldn't list them. There's, there's so many. That, uh, George, is the one that's really shaped you? As a kid, you know, you could watch Saturday afternoons, you could watch movies, we, you know, that's how you really got to see a lot of black and white films and stuff. And I, I think the first time I saw uh, uh, To Kill a Mockingbird sort of really, I, I understood, because he was sort of the reluctant hero, I really, that, I was very moved by that. I was moved by uh, It's a Wonderful Life because they showed it every Christmas and I always thought that it was such an interesting film because, you know, the bad guy gets away, Lionel Barrymore gets away with it at the end and you couldn't do a film like that anymore where the bad guy doesn't you know now you'd have to haul Lionel Barrymore away in handcuffs yeah. going, yeah, well, 
and you, you know, and I, I was very. But Cheney's still doing well. <laughs> <laughs> but I, yeah, I, I was very impressed by older films like the Spencer Tracy film, Inherit the Wind. I loved those films, you know. American films, not foreign films. I, I grew up in Kentucky. <laughs> you know, that's what no. you saw. You don't Chris. see very, very many foreign films. Christoph, what about you? Well, the same thing that, that Gary said. You know, there's there are so many because you're never like a, a, a stagnant entity that, that remains mm -hmm. the same. So you, you develop into whatever direction and, and uh, that's, that's the part of the beauty of movies that they speak to you in a different language whenever, they, um, whenever you encounter them. So I've seen, I, I'm sorry I used that example before, but I've seen eight and a half, maybe oh. 25 times. Yeah. Yeah. And every yeah. time, uh, for the first time I've ever seen it, uh, um, uh, the, the first time I've seen it, I was about 15. Mm. And I had no clue what was going on, yet it really was uh, yeah. one mm. big amazement. Mm -hmm. And today I watch it, well, maybe tomorrow, uh, and it, it'll be something completely mm -hmm. different. Christopher. Well, I grew up, uh, fortunately, I, I grew up in Quebec, so we got a lot of French actors mm. that used to come over from Paris as well, and then I'd watch them on the screen, and in the 40s, that was the best time for the French, because they were both those wonderful theater actors who also played in film. Mm. And that that incredible renaissance when uh, Jean Renoir and people like that were directing Favorite. was just superb. And, and the, probably the film that I cried mostly at, I still do actually, uh, is uh, Le Grand Illusion. Oh, my uh, because at the end, uh, when Jean Gabin and the woman who was trying to save them in their lives and feeds them. Dito Parlo. Yes and should they fall in love and I've never seen on the screen anything more touching than the fact that y you could just tell they had fallen in love because they don't ever look at each other <laughs> wow. mm -hmm. and he, wow. he leaves without looking at her and it was an example of how how wonderfully unsentimental things can be that of course regurgitate sentimentality yes. extraordinary I stuff I also love the German School too, Werner uh, uh, Krauss and all that yeah. history of the German cinema. I mean, a lot of them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My favorite one was which my first wife hated. She <laughs> thought it was the Nothing worst good. film, Doctor Strange Love. Oh, no. That oh, yes. profoundly affected me because if you could laugh and all that stuff, riding the Tommy bomb down to the end, I thought it was just <laughs> great. And then when I heard, when Altman told me the story about Sterling Hayden uh, telling Stanley that he was just couldn't do it, he couldn't do this, these great actors, Peter Sellers and George C. Scott, I, I, I'm not up to that quality. And, and Kubrick said, are you paranoid, are you? He said, yeah, I'm terribly paranoid. He said, well, keep it, <laughs> use it. Then, then when Kubrick asked, uh, Ryan to cut off his leg. It was a classy. <laughs> if you don't know about it, I'll tell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, they shot everything they had, could shoot without the, his one leg. And Kubrick called him in and he said, you know, it's just a terrible problem. I, you know, I've shot it from every angle. We've tied up the leg. We've done this. We've done this. We've done this. I have the best doctors from Sweden. <laughs> it's 60 minutes from taking it off to tying everything up. And uh, it's real simple. And, uh, of course, I'll double your salary. Uh, <laughs> I just think for the film, it's the right thing to do. <laughs> and Ryan said, you, you want me to cut off my leg for the film? <laughs> no, I won't do it. No. <laughs> but I think he damn near had him almost. <laughs> I think that's a perfect no-came conversation. Thank you, guys. This is great. It's so lovely to have you here. Uh, Christoph and George, thanks so much for doing this again. And really... Everyone, it's just an honor to have you here. And um, I wanted to say my film, The Pawnbroker, mm -hmm. when I was oh, in, yeah. in high school, mm -hmm. 
the, the reality of that film made me think, oh, look what movies can do. Because yeah. I'd never seen a film until then yeah. that looked almost like a documentary. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and it still holds right. up incredibly well. Yeah, it's yeah. so good, the backyards.